Great. Okay. Well, thank you everybody who made it onto Zoom to join us for this, uh, our first virtual brown bag lunch talk um, with Zipei Tang, uh, a GTU PhD student um, in yoga studies. Is that correct, Zipei? Yes. What's your yeah. focus? Um, so Zipei received a spring care grant from us last semester and is going to tell us what she did with those grant, with that grant funding. Um, so I will pass it over to you, Zipei. Okay. Thank you so much, Lydia. So um, I should start to share my screen and I will talk about um, the whole project that I did. Um, it's an unfinished project um, and I'm really happy to share it here and to have some feedback from people. All right. So um, my research is uh, around the Paducah women um, who are tribal Indian women and they are practicing art, art making um, through a workshop. And my research topic is the art, yoga, and womanhood in Nimboli, Maharashtra, India. Um, and I want to help everybody to geographically locate this woman. Um, so I'm going to show you a little um, um, map of where are these women. Okay, so this is, um, I used the grant that um, Kier gave me um, to come to India. And it is an area that is very close to Mumbai. And I took a train from Mumbai to a nearby city called Virar. And then from Virar, I have to take local bus to this kind of a green area around this part. And we see what Jeshwari is a larger town in that area. And if I zoom in, I can see Ganeshpuri. And Ganeshpuri is the local town and I'll talk about it. And from Ganeshpuri, and cross the bridge of the Tanasa River. And this is the local environment. It's pretty beautiful there. Um, and I went there last January and it was very hot at the time, but it's already the cooler season. And move upward or north to the north. And I can see this little area is where the art workshop is located. So um, it is a area that is uh, only 60 miles away from Mumbai, but the infrastructure and the social environment is very far different from the, the modern city like Mumbai, India. Um, and the town uh, nearby it, which the Paducah woman say, okay, if, it, if anybody asks me where am I from, I'm from Ganeshpuri, which is the small town across the bridge from the art workshop is called um, Ganeshpuri. And it is um, the change of that area is brought to this tribal forest area by a spiritual teacher called Nityananda. And on the left side, we can see there is um, the book called the Bhagwan Nityananda of Ganeshpuri. And Bhagwan is a Sanskrit word, means um, divinity or God. So this teacher is revered as a incarnation of the divine. And this is a photo of this guru when he was reciting reciting in Ganeshpuri. And before he, he went there, the whole area was tribal, was very primal, and there's no um, there's no change in the area for, for many years. 
And my research is focusing on the art, yoga, and women in tribal India. And when I started the project, when I was envisioning it, I was trying to see how does the woman utilize art as their yoga praxis. And when I really get to the local area and start to, to, um, to be with them and to talk to them and witness their life, I realized that um, what really touched me is their womanhood, is how they um, identify themselves as women and how um, the context of being a woman in India, being a woman in this local area really influence their choice of life and also giving meaning to their art workshop. So my research drastically changed more into the aspect of the feminine. So in my report, I want to touch on um, three major contexts of womanhood or feminine in India. And the first one um, is on the glorious feminine India, which is um, more through the lens of the religion of India. So the first aspect is the presence of Devi. Devi means goddess in Sanskrit. And we can see there's a collage of different um, symbols, images of the goddess India, and there's a lot of them. So just give a very simplified explanation of the goddess worshiping, the goddess culture of India. So the one essential tenet of Hinduism is Shakti, the feminine energy. And it is believed to represent the primeval creative principle underlying the cosmos. She is the energizing force of every being and every act and everything. And the energy of God is feminine. And so this, this is talking about the masculine God, right? The energy of God is, is feminine. And without his Shakti, even the most powerful male gods are powerless and even dead. And this is symbolized um, in the image of Kali dancing on the corpse of Shiva. And all, and the, the all powerful feminine force assumes diverse forms, taking different avatars to fulfill diverse purposes at different times. For example, Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth, Saraswati pers personifies wisdom and learning and is presiding deity of arts and literature. Durga is the vanquisher of evil. And various rivers in India, Ganga, Narmada, Yumuna are also worshiped as mother goddesses. And we can, we can really feel how important is the, the idea of feminine in the festivals of India. Out, out of the three most celebrated festivals, two of them are centered around a goddess worship. The first one is Diwali the festival of light and they celebrate Lakshmi who is who is the goddess that brings wealth brings felicity into the family and the second biggest festival is Navratri and it's a 10 days festival and the major deity of the festival is Mahadevi or Durga and almost throughout the subcontinent people celebrate this festival and the second evidence of the presence of Devi in India is the temples. And I'm focusing only on this area of the Paduka woman that we're, we're, I'm studying. Um, so the biggest city nearby is Mumbai. And Mumbai, this name comes from a goddess whose name is Momba. And because of this temple, the of the goddess Mumba on the left side, um, Mumbai, the city, um, gained its name and developed um, developed around this goddess. And one of the biggest temple in Mumbai is the Mahalakshmi temple. It's right by the ocean. Um, 
and it's one of the celebrated um, deities of Mumbai, especially Lakshmi is symbolizing wealth and beauty, where Mumbai is the capital of, is the financial capital and also the capital of fashion, of culture in India. And now um, the nearby, the nearby city called Vajeshwari is one of the important area that really influenced the entire tribal forest neighborhood because the Vajeshwari um, area is, is uh, said to be the residence of this goddess called Vajeshwari. And she is so powerful that her presence in the local area produces many natural hot springs. And it is those hot springs that attracts people to start to visit this area. And we can see on the left corner, the Vajrasura is in the, right, uh, in the red circle and the green heart area is where the art, sh art workshop is located. And um, the spiritual teacher that I mentioned, Bhagwan Nityananda, actually came to um, Ganesh Puri because of this goddess, this goddess temple and the hot springs that he find that this is a place full of Shakti. So he decided to start his spiritual practice there and then he attracts lots of followers um, and Ganesh Puri start to um, gain more attention and development. And this is another um, local Kali temple inside Ganesh Puri. And very interestingly is this one. This is um, only about 10 minutes walk from the art workshop of the Paduka woman. And if I walk across the field into, into the, the land and around 10 minutes, I can find this little, little temple called the Gaudevi temple, or some people in India say it's Grand Devi temple. And this is a temple that local people put their resources, their effort, and their money to build. It is not um, inherited from history and it's not supported by the government. Local people there are mostly in poverty, but they still really try their best to build this small, very um, humble temple. And they use the mud to to shape the very kind of very primal shapes of feminine and it is to symbolize the the feminine power the earth the nature in this village and to try to pray to the shakti the feminine force to bless this land to help them out of poverty to grant them um, happiness and i'll show you a little video just explaining the idea of Gram Devi. And as you well know, every village in India has a Gram Devi or Devata. Gram Devatas are usually connected with acts of extreme piety, but myths of Gram Devis tell us of ordinary women who rose in rage because they were sought to be ravished or to avenge other wrongdoers. Their righteous rage has the potential to destroy the universe and thus elevates them to the status of the divine. And as I said a minute ago, the continuing tradition of goddess worship the, in, in, um, in the humblest of village, it's not something that we've had to be taught. Uh, in the West, they are battling to find space for women um, because the mythology itself or theology itself treats women as a junior partner. Um, our Eves were not created from Adam's rib. Um, they are the energizing force of, of, of universe and even men look to such women for protection. So we can, we can see from this woman's talk and from all this worship of the Devi that the, the, feminine, the feminine principle is, is really revered in India and it is worshipped celebrated and respected. And this is a, 
a short video of the Paducah woman during their every day, they will do an RRT together. RRT means worship. And they will do an RRT around noon every day. And they're chanting this <laughs> So this is a mantra called the Gayatri Mantra, and it is one of the most well-known mantras in India. And Gayatri Mantra is dedicated to this goddess called Savitri, which is a goddess symbolizing light, and she is also um, equal to the great goddess, who is the 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 godhead, who is. Um, in a sense, Brahman in Indian theology. So you can see all the other male devata or male gods there has come out of from her. And she is said to be another manifestation of goddess uh, Saraswati. And Saraswati is the goddess of art and learning. And therefore the Paduka women, because they are in the art workshop, they will chant her mantra to try to invoke her presence and her energy and her power. And this is are the three goddesses I find on their altar in their worship. On the left side, there is Durga. And in the middle, um, I think it's Tara, but at the same time, it's um, a little bit different. The hand gesture is a little bit different than the Tibetan Tara, but Tara is also one of the um, 10 Mahavidyas of India. And on the right side is goddess Saraswati, Saraswati. And the goddesses are not only on their altar, it's also in their art. There is one of the women, Jai Shri, and she is um, making art out of this image of Durga, and she's copying her image on her art. And actually woman or goddess is one of the major theme of their artworks. So these are some photos I took of their already finished art. And it is one of their favorite subject to make is beautiful um, embodiment of the feminine power. And you can see it's not only um, kind of Hindu, traditional Hindu um, symbols of woman. There's a lot of um, their own interpretations and creative creativities weaving into it. And here, there's another little altar on the other room of their art workshop. And in the middle, there's the woman. Her name is Savitri Bai Bude. She's a real human um, woman, but she is revered as a goddess incarnation in India because she is the first one to start education for women, who started girls' schools in India. And the Paduka woman really respected her um, because of her revolutionary feminist um, actions in her life. And on the other side, India not only have a lot of goddesses, India also had a lot of powerful leaders, women, female leaders. For example, um, there is the president of Indian National Congress, Sarojini Naidu. And then there is the, um, second. so the Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay uh, is also a very well-known poet and activist for Hindu reformation. And then, um, Fatima Bivi, she is the uh, judge or the, the first female judge in the Supreme Court of India. 
And of course, there's Indira Gandhi, who is the um, first female prime minister of India. And also, there are a lot of female gurus in India, female spiritual leaders. For example, Ananda, uh, um, Ananda Maima, which is on the left side, and then Sarada Devi, who is the wife of Ramakrishna, and also she herself is a teacher, uh, Sarada Devi. And in the middle, there's Amma um, or Amrita Anandamai. And then on the right corner is Mataji Nirmada Devi. Oh, no, sorry. On the right corner is Ananda Murti Guruma, and she's a contemporary guru. She's still having a lot of followers. And then on the right side corner is Mataji Nirmala Devi, who started the Saharaja Yoga. And the local area actually separated its own female guru. Her name is Guru Mai. And we can see on the map that the orange circle is where the art workshop is. And down there on the green area, actually I um, um, highlighted with the red dot, is a big ashram, very big ashram. And this ashram is started by a disciple of um, Nityananda, which is the first guru of the area. And now the spiritual leader of the entire organization called Siddha Yoga is a female guru called Guru Mai. And there are Sita Yoga centers all around the world, including in Oakland. So my conclusion is that India seems to have abundant symbols, theories, and role models for feminine power, sorry, feminine power, beauty, wisdom, and femininity is rever revered, glorified, and celebrated in the entire subcontinent maybe even more than the civilization we live in. And the Paducah women are immersed in such a culture. However, what is the reality like for the woman in India? And this is the second context I wanna talk about. And now I wanna show you this survey done by an organization um, that is very authoritative. Uh, it's the survey of the world's most dangerous countries for women. And it's the latest is down in 2018. And it will list 10 countries of the most dangerous country for women. And the first one on the rank is India. On the second is Afghanistan, third is Syria, then Somalia and Saudi Arabia. And this survey actually um, really raise a lot of awareness in India because they're shocked about this um, result that women really are suffering so much, even more than all these other countries that we relate war and famine and disease um, heavily on the other countries where well, India is still number one. And this survey is down for in six areas, including health discrimination, cultural and religion, sexual violence, non-sexual violence, and human trafficking. And India is the most dangerous country in three aspects, including cultural and religion. That mostly is because child marriage and forced marriage is so, and also infanticide, it's so prevalent, it's so pervasive in India. And the and also it's number one in sexual violence. Um, if you know there recently in 2012, there's a very famous event in New Delhi and the film was made uh, out of it called India's Daughters. And it's totally about the, the rape culture of India. And women, honestly, in my personal feeling is women do not have even the basic security when they're walking on the street. Um, the sense of sexual violence is really harsh there. And also um, India is number one in human trafficking. Um, 
and it is number three in non-sexual violence, mostly because of domestic abuse and also discrimination because of the uh, lack of education and lack of workforce um, job opportunities in India for women. So I wanna just talk about the few aspects of this and it is very, um, in a sense, very heavy for me when I was doing this research because in, on one side, um, there is the beautiful, glorious feminine culture uh, in India. But on the other side, there is this really horrible situation for real women. And the first one is at birth, girls are um, already facing danger when they're an infant. In the, in the census of India in 2018, for every 100 boys born, there are only 93 girls are born. And women constitute only 48.1% of the population. And this ratio, I think, is um, the second worst. And the first worst is China, I think, is because the sexual selective abortion is also very heavy in China. And India has 49 million fewer women than men across India. And this number, in a sense, showed how much, how many girls, how many girls, um, girl babies didn't got born because of the sexual, of uh, the sex selective abortion. And there's a quote from an Indian doctor, and he said that the biggest challenge for a doctor is to tell, sorry, the biggest, wait, let me see, I'm having jumping screen. Uh, sorry. Okay, the biggest challenge for a doctor is to tell relatives that a patient has died. For me, it was equally difficult to tell families that they had a daughter. They would celebrate and distribute sweets if a male child was born, but if a girl was born, the relatives would leave the hospital, the mother would cry, and the families would ask for a discount. And this is really um, evident even in Nimboli, in the area that I was studying. There's not so much um sexual selective abortion in the area that i know because the sad truth is they don't even enjoy the basic health care that woman just cannot get abortion um in general because and therefore there's a very hard situation for the local woman is that they will give birth so, to so many babies and their physical condition will decline because of the really a lot of labor of birth and raising up kids. Um, but, but the gender preference is very clear in the area too. And then the second is about education. Gender in, in inequality has deterred education for girls in India. And the families will not necessarily have the financial support for girls. And if they have limited money, they will choose to support the, the, the son, the boy, to go to school instead of the girls. And there's a lot of reason for that. If you talk to a woman in India, you will know that most important is because the culture sees the daughter as not really theirs. After she's married, the daughter belongs to another family. Therefore, um, marrying her off means she has left the family. So when they are raising up the girl, many of the Indian parents felt like I'm raising up a girl um, for another family and they feel it's a burden. Um, and therefore, when the girl is married, the girl's parents have to give a big amount of money to the boy's family for accepting her, for accepting her. And um, therefore, child marriage is also a very common practice because the family are very eager to send their daughter off so they don't have to pay for her anymore. And it says that a third of girls in India marrying off their educational futures. And it's also happening in the local area in Nimboli. 
that most of the girls in the neighborhood are arranged marriage in their teenage years. And these are some photos of the local area, girls missing out education due to daily chores. Not only, even if the family can afford, for example, in the local area, actually there's free education for kids up to a certain age because of the spiritual guru Nityananda started an education fund. But still many families choose to not even send their daughter to the free schools because they would rather have an extra hand at home. And there's this girl in the Paducah uh, workshop. It is kind of, a, in a sense, a bittersweet story that she find the art workshop so she can still get a, a, an, an amount of education to study, um, to become literate and to study making art. But it also reflects on the sad truth that she just didn't have the privilege to go to a public school to get the kind of education that you know other girls can enjoy. Um, this is just another fact about the area that in 2001, um, the tribal woman's uh, literacy rate is only 18.2. Most of the women there can speak, but they cannot read and they cannot even do simple math. And another aspect is child marriage, as I mentioned before. Um, there's uh, data in 2017 in the whole country that 27% of the women are married by 18. And it's even more worse in the tribal area in Nimboli. Um, and one of the good thing about the Paducah workshop is that young girls fight to put off marriage and avoid health hazards because of they can they can um, support themselves they can choose to say no to child marriage and they can using making art to um, to say no to the family when they say you have to marry off to another family and that immediately means they have to give birth um, at a very young age and about um, getting a job for women. So this is a um, comparison of India and US. So in India, less than a quarter of women are employed and 78.6 of men are employed. Uh, no, the workforce, less than a quarter is women and more than a quarter is men. Comparing to U.S., almost it's half and half. It's 46.9% uh, to 57.1%. So now I want to come to the third contact, which is the tribal woman, the Adivasi tribal woman. Their tribe's name is Adivasi, but they don't really use that word anymore. Um, they identify themselves just as um, the Nimboli woman or the Ganesh Puri woman. So um, the general condition of the entire area for men and women is poverty. About 48% of the families are illiterate, unskilled, landless, and live below poverty level. And they're suffering easily from easily treatable disease and lack of food. And most of them are having no uh, malnutrition, uh, malnutri malnutrition, most of them are very skinny. And um, the problems of poverty, malnutrition, poor health, due to the lack of clean water, poor hygiene practices, lack of education, and lack of access to medicine and medical care. And for women in particular, this is all the information I'm quoting from the organization called Sri Nityananda Education educational trust. It is this organization that helped me to, you know, find this woman, start translate for me. Um, they're very helpful and they're doing great works in the area. And Paducah Women Workshop is actually initiated by this organization. And this organization said that women who are living for, living far from the beneficial infrastructure of modern India, the tribal women work hard to provide new 
nourishment and comfort to their families. They collect water at the well or local uh, river three to eight times a day, collect firewood for an hour or more than a day to cook, to cook food on a simple three brick stove, and get up early to wash clothes in the local river, all before the family goes off to work and school. Afterwards, some of them have to go find work for themselves. Most of the jobs in our area require hard labor, such as farming, brick making, and construction. So this is the uh, front of the art workshop, this little building, and they um, built this building themselves in 2006, I think. And right opposite to this building is the village. And this village just really is very underdeveloped. Um, there, everybody is living in poverty. For example, on the left side is one of the most unfortunate women in the area, and I visit her a lot. She is actually, um, she, don't, she doesn't really um, complain about her poverty, but this is her home. She's living under this tent and um, really survive on doing labors for other, other people and by charity. On the right side is a family that is relatively fortunate, relatively doing fine. And this is inside their room. Um, and they don't have electricity, they don't have clean water, they don't have really basic comfort. And for the woman, it's necessary for them to get up before family to wash clothes and cook food. And sometimes I like to take very early morning walks. And on the left side of the photo is when I took around before 6 a.m. in the morning. And you can see women washing clothes um, by the river and by the sun, by sunrise, they already finished their laundry and they're carrying their laundry on their head to go back home. And then three to eight times per day, they have to come to these wells away from the family to get the water. And cooking also takes a lot of time for the local woman. And many local women cook not only for the family, but also, um, in a sense, they help the community who are doing farming work and brick making work uh, and construction work. And this is the biggest employment opportunity for this area is making bri bricks. And it is really a harsh situation. When I first come to the area, it, although it's January, it was so hot, it was almost a hundred degree and I was, in the air conditioned little car and I'm already feeling dehydrated and having a heat stroke and I look outside the window and all these people are doing hard labor under the sunshine. Um, and this is another, the three women are doing construction work. And there's two other women nearby the Gal Devi temple doing farming work. So in general, the condition for the local woman is very desperate. And for them, it's really hard to see any, uh, even a, a slice of hope in, you know, to get rid of um, this kind of um, difficulties in life. And then I wanna finally come to the art and the yoga of the Paduka woman and try to make sense in all these three contexts make sense of their practice. So this is a photo of what really happened that changed their life is that the Sri Nityananda um, edu Educational Trust is an organization funded because of the religious teacher um, and many Westerners because of the Sita Yoga organization start to pay attention to this area and they start to organize workshops for the local woman to there it's a free invitation um, for local women to learn to make art that can sell so that they can find a way out of their um, predicament and this is the first workshop uh, of making quote 
So it's a workshop of how to select um, colors and patterns and how to design a beautiful quilt. And then a second workshop is the tribal women are taught to make yo-yos. Yo-yos are kind of a um, round piece of fabric and they can connect with each other and make different art, um, art or um, things you can use. So I wanna talk about their practice in three aspects. Um, the first one is um, to see their art practice as practicing freedom, which is the liberation from conditioned womanhood and awaken to new possibility and changing perspective of reality. So let me uh, read this, sorry. I am blocked by my, sorry, I have to find a way to, I'm sorry, okay, let me try to do this. So the seemingly small acts of art making, including picking colors, designing patterns, sewing fabric, not only means creative self-expression for the Adivasi woman, it is most essentially an act of conscious revolution, which make them become aware of their own plead. And so it leads them from the unconscious living in the given way of life to awakening to their own freedom and their power of change. So they can break the vicious circle and become their own savior. So art empowers Adivasi women to choose an alternative way of living and radically transform their relationship with their family and their environment. In a sense, they are rebelling against the oppression of women, not through anger, but in a benign, beautiful, and productive way. Moreover, they are healing the unfortunate fate and trauma that was passed down to them from their ancestral mothers of their tribe. So one of the examples is a woman called Asha Moore. And she is now becoming kind of a leader figure in this group because how um, powerfully she fight against her so-called fate. That she was married to, um, she was a typical, um, like she lived a typical life. She was married off very early and she is married to a husband who didn't abuse her that much, but, but she was living in a difficult family situation where she was supposed to just do chores, raise up kids, and not necessarily is an uh, independent or empowered woman, but a woman that is just a wife and just a mother. Um, and, and she was desperate, de desperately wanting to express her own individuality, but couldn't find a way. And then when she started to come to the art workshop, and she was one of the first women to come, and uh, her family didn't want her to because her family think it is um, degrading. It is because the I think what I learned from the whole interviews with the woman is there's so much um, deep rooted uh, ideas about how women should be. What are actually um, the, the standard that women, the invisible rules the wo that women should follow and becoming independent, expressing themselves is definitely not what they should do in the traditional sense. And when Asha come to the workshop, her family didn't allow her. The family uh, fight against it. And she decided to um, stay strong and keep coming to the art workshop and becoming one of the first women to um, really gain a living for herself to make enough of the work, artwork that she can become financially independent. And when that happened, their families start to change attitude around this situation. 
And one of the big moments for Asha's life is when the Paducah Women's Workshop uh, got a chance to do a small exhibition in New Delhi, which is kind of far from where they live in Mumbai. And she got to take a long, long train ride to New Delhi, which is she never imagined before. And she got to go to the big city and present her artwork as an artist. And their family finally changed their attitude. And Asha now is a happy woman, is an empowered woman. And she really inspired a lot of others to do so. And another, another thing is, this is not an easy choice for them. The Paducah woman are discriminated against and isolated by their fellow tribal men and women. And um, this is a very uh, strange phenomenon that the Paducah woman, when they make the choice to come to the, our workshop, she is kind of, they are de declaiming that they, ch uh, declaring that they are choosing the alternative way of life. They're choosing to be liberated. And this make other women who are so much entrapped in the conditioned mindset to feel uh, threatened, to feel challenged, and men and women feel threatened, challenged, and their old way of thinking is being shaken. And therefore they become fearful about the Paducah woman and they start to isolate them. They start to roll their eyes against them. And even the women in the nearby houses around the Paducah woman workshop, they will refuse to talk to the Paducah woman and they will curse them for being disgraceful. And it is really strange. And many of the women, when they first come to the Paducah woman uh, workshop, they have to really emotionally suffer from this. But after a while, they become uh, empowered, and I'll talk about that later. And the second aspect I want to talk about is yoga as evolution. It is that in the space of creativity, Adivasa women are discovering their aesthetic potentials and finding new identities. And this relates to an idea in yoga, uh, which is the five koshas. The five koshas are, in a sense, the five bodies that we each individual possess. And in the most gross layer, the most um, outside concrete manifest layer is our physical body, Anamaya Kosha. And then there's the energetic body, the mind and emotion body, the wisdom body, and the bliss body. Um, and the ascetic expression comes from the bliss body, comes from the inner soul. Therefore, the Adivasa woman lived as if in a perpetual winter of poverty, hard labor, and oppression. Difficulties in the physical reality deprived them the sensibility of intrinsic joy and beauty. The utilization of their ascetic abilities in art making thaws the frost of their soul and softened the callous of their heart. And they're getting in touch with their talent and the ananda, the bliss, and allowing the creative creativity to flow by reconnecting this with this the subtle depth of themselves art becomes paduka woman's yoga and evolution so the the tribal woman in paduka they really naturally can have the ability to have a have a, a sense of beauty that is really brilliant and it is really in the depth of their spiritual core and this artwork allowed them to finally come to becoming aware of it and utilize it there's a photo of them celebrating their finished work and the last point i want to make is that the paduka woman art workshop give them a community to support their, their uh, independence, their self-alliance. And it's a community of dignified women giving each other confidence. So overall, community is the most important aspect for the Paducah woman's liberation. The woman can sympathize easily with each other's suffering, and they are each other's mirrors and role models even more important, more powerful than the goddess or the legendary female leaders to each other. 
when one of them is strong enough to succeed in this transformation. And embraced and supported by the group, individual women gains the courage and the strength to hope and to rediscover their own dignity and sovereignty. And there's another um, image of them celebrating. And last, I want to show all these beautiful artworks they did of self-portraits, which is a very uh, liberating art workshop they once had um, to really celebrate their own beauty. And these are all the beautiful ways they're celebrating their own um, new identity in the art. And at last is all the women that I really enjoyed spending time with this January. And that's it. That's my presentation. And I don't know if I really go over time too much or not. Um, let me try to stop share screen. OK. Thank you so much. And I don't know if I have time for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Zipe. We have around five minutes for some. Oh, I'm so sorry to go. No, 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 not at all. It was super interesting. Thank you. Thank so, if you. anyone does have questions, is, just feel free to. Is the foundation that established this, the Education Foundation, is that of Indian origin, or who supports that? So, the the foundation is a group of disciples of um, this. This, so, it, so it is kind of complicated. So Nityananda is uh, the spiritual guru, like the, the Adi guru, the first guru. And then he had a few disciples. And one of the disciples is called Muktananda. And his student is that Guru Mai, the female guru. And these um, trust who started it are disciple of Muktananda, the male guru, but they're not too much associated with the female guru, but they are associated in the sense of a cousin lineage with the Siddha Yoga that we can find uh, all around the globe. So and where are they selling their artwork and is it abroad or in India? Yes, they are selling their artworks locally and also online. Um, I will send the, um, their online website, it's, uh, it's called an e-boutique of their artworks, um, and you can find what they're, what they're offering right now. And most of their artworks are actually um, uh, purchased by, in a sense, by the disciples of this spiritual lineage, this Siddha Yoga people will buy their artwork in support of the organization. Wow. Yeah. Great work. Any other Is questions? you're going to write on? Uh, I, well, I think I want to write on it, but for this semester, you know, I come back from India right the time when the semester starts, and I'm focusing on my coursework, so I didn't really do more research on that because I also just find that all this all this research of the Indian woman's situation really is such a big like open up so much to study and it's pretty heavy and I think I have really have the long journey ahead of me if I want to use a feminist perspective a fe feminist methodology to apply on this this art and yoga of this woman. Um, and in a sense, I am, my, my final, my dissertation direction is more on the evolution, more on conscious evolution and yoga. And so I think may, maybe perhaps I will integrate this, but only from um, the more evolution and yoga awareness, that aspect because the, I'm, I'm not too familiar with feminist um, literature. And yeah, but I, I'm really willing to learn more. Yeah. It's so great. Okay, I think there is a, is there another question? Okay, thank you, Susan. <laughs> All right, is there any other questions?
it's amazing work Zipay. thank you thank you so much yeah you know zipe this whole time i've been trying to look up there's like a a clip i must have seen from a film where a woman is an indian woman is standing in the street and she's saying you know we don't want to be worshipped we don't want your devotion we want to just be treated as equals we want to you know, yeah have, this have is, standing in society we don't want to be go your goddesses we want to totally be, this you know, is one of the most profound and complicated question i'm mm -hmm. asking myself how come there's goddess worshiping india so much and the divine feminine is so celebrated in india actually more than any other culture i know However, woman, you know, as rated, is the, is the most dangerous country for women. How, how come there's such a big contrast? And one of the, the thing is, I feel that people in India do not even understand women per se, but they understand, in a sense, they, they, they see goddess but they don't see woman and therefore one of the argue the cry for women is to to argue that do not put put us on the altar and say we're woman like there is a practice of the kumaris which is the worshiping of virgin girls which is very pervasive in india so in india if a girl has not had her period she is said to be the incarnation of goddess and in a lot of areas of the of india the little girl will be put on dramatic clothes and become the symbol of goddess and the group of people will put flower on her feet and touch her feet and get blessing from her from this little girl and when the little girl had her period it because she become a woman and then it becomes impure she becomes impure and she becomes a woman and when she becomes a woman she is suffering from a lot of things and yeah it's definitely still a complex question i have to ask why why is why is there goddess and why is there why the goddess and the woman's status is so different mm -hmm. yeah thank you okay. for the questions yeah. thank you so much Zipe. if thank there's so much it just takes a lot to oh. think about yes mm -hmm. you know yes. it's so it's so sort of intense yeah you know, i would say but i really i was gonna say even in the beginning i really liked the way that you showed us where you went mm -hmm. by following that map i because i really felt like oh yeah because it's totally unfamiliar to me but actually that was like a really good way to kind of feel like for me to feel like okay i get where we are i'm situated i get the landscape and you know to see the the uh, small temple that had been set up in the countryside and you know leading us through to and then the contrast between you know here like you were just saying here's all the the goddess worship and the feminine divine and how that's the male gods don't even exist without the feminine component um and then this here's the real and i was going to say well if that was the end of your talk i was ready to ask you but what about you know this yeah. reality that you read about in the papers all the time and then you did you you know handled that whole side of it and it's just yeah, I don't, that, that ah, problem of how those things come together, or how does that even happen, or, you know, that women aren't viewed as the goddesses, or as connected to the goddesses, because they're up on the pedestal, and women are, are you know, down below everything. It's just, um, you know, I'm already, like, so mad at the world and the patriarchy that I can like hardly stand it you know so it is anyway I thank totally, you thank you it's it's totally <laughs> very emotional it's got it gets me yeah. to feel very yeah. emotional and anger and fear sometimes to do some research around Indian Indian woman's um situation and it is sometimes very hard and i was um 
also looking some even darker aspect that was not um, reflecting in the Nimboli women. The Nimboli women are mostly um, facing discrimination, poverty, mm -hmm. um, oppression. But for girls in other part of the country where there's bigger cities, their danger is sexual violence and it's very horrible in India. And when I research on those areas, it's very hard. It's very difficult, yeah. Well, one of the things it shows is that men will co-opt everything, including the goddess. Yes. <laughs> right. So that's, you know, so true. we have to really think about patriarchy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you for listening. thank you very much. All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. All right. Time to go. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Okay. For thank, it. You. thank you. Bye bye. Good to see everybody. Good yeah. to see everybody. Bye. bye.